Okay, cool. So, um, hey guys, welcome back to another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. Today we're going to take a little bit of a gander, a little bit of a journey into the murky world of identity politics. Um, and, and we're going to discuss today a bit more around how identity politics is shaping your business, um, how you can navigate the world of identity politics, and and basically what are some of the, the principles and um, positive outcomes that you can manifest in your businesses as a result of that. So um, with me today, I have a good friend of mine, none other than Brent Tolman. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be back. Th- <laughs> again, yeah. Um, yeah it keeps happening. I know, I know. But it's uh, it's always great to to connect with you. Um, the precursor to this show, or the premise of the show was um, I gave Brent a call last week and we started talking about all things identity and political. Um, and we felt that this was a conversation that really needed to, to be had. Um, it's certainly one that um, I haven't had on the show before. And nonetheless, still very, very relevant um to to south africa specifically um but not only south africa identity politics is playing in every country around the world and it's shaping societal norms and cultural conditions and the hierarchical systems that are predicated in many of our country uh you know sort of legislative bodies and just in many other facets of life this is a very important thing for all of us to be talking about well thankfully it's been playing out more in the media than necessarily the courts um but um it's definitely had a giant impact on culture uh, we also decided that this was a dangerous topic a very dangerous topic both of us were just a little bit nervous about it um but i think I think our combined backgrounds, I mean, mine certainly in uh, customer user experience and psychology um, and working with organizations to really tackle some of those really difficult sort of conversations. Mm. I think therein the relevance of what is the relevance of identity politics, I suppose, to companies like I, it lives in the it lives in the in the political sphere mm. and we all follow their hashtags, etc. Um, but you know, I guess there. I guess the first question is, you know, what is the danger and what is the importance for companies? Well, let's go back even further and say, well, what is identity politics and what is an, what is the manifestation of that? So, the Bell Pottinger Gupta scenario is a, probably the most well known example of identity politics in action. Um, yep. Can you walk us through? And in the process of using that example, just kind of land some principles around what identity politics actually means. Okay, so at its most basic level, identity politics is the tendency uh, for people of a particular race, ethnicity, gender, social background, etc., to form exclusive political and social alliances. Prejudices, essentially. Um, they can have prejudices, um, but they tend to be based on the fact that they identify as something. Mm. And then they, to to quote Noam Chomsky, they other another group. Mm. So they other them. So we're they're not like us. Mm. We're like us, and they're like that. The problem innately in that whole uh, sort of paradigm is it becomes an either or scenario, and both yourself and the other group become slave to certain traits, which neither of you really get to decide about. Um, so. I don't know if identity politics is even good for the people who are proponents of it. I just don't know if they realize it. Um, but the truth is, I, I don't know if we should be whinging per se about identity politics. I think um, we really need to understand the underlying motives, uh, really understand, understand what's driving it, um, and then understand what, you know, you know, how, you know, what's the way forward? How can we protect businesses and ourselves from the risks, but at the same time also learn the valuable lessons that I think that identity to- politics comes to, comes to give us. I don't think we can simply reject it. I think we have to understand why it happened and what it's there to show us as a mirror of our own selves. Yeah. So what, you know, using the Gupta, um, Bell Passenger example, how were identity politics being used to divide a country. Let's go there first. 
Okay, so when we looked at the Bill Pottinger, do- when, the, when that document got leaked, the first thing that scrimped out was that they had a specific uh, campaign to use white capital as a, as a label for all things that were bad about South Africa and to and essentially drive a populist agenda um, that said the, the, pop- the populist, the people, are good and legitimate and the elites are evil. And they're and they're usurping. What we saw from the Bill Pottinger document, because they were pretty blatant about it, um, was that they did this specifically to distract South Africans from what Zuma and the Guptas were actually doing. So this isn't my opinion. This is public knowledge. So state capture essentially. State capture. So when you so I mean that's a bloody scary thought, right? And thank God, I mean the likes of Alec Hogg who's been on the show. Um, and some very courageous journalists went above and beyond to get that whole narrative um, in the public domain and, and spoken about, and ultimately that led to you know Zuma leaving office. Mm-hmm. Thank God. Um, <clears throat> so, but when you think about um, how that then you know trickles down into the business ecosystem that many of my listeners who run businesses will, will find themselves in. What is shaping, or what is the role that identity politics is actually playing in the everyday lives of entrepreneurs such as myself and yourself and many others out there? Okay, so as an entrepreneur, as a manager of a company or a director in a corporate, you're, I imagine that you would like to have a united workplace, that you that division between people, such as, so going back to the, the Guptas or Zuptas, the divisive politics that they engineered are not good for your workplace. Because as we know, that united workplaces are more productive, they're more harmonious, um, they're better at mentoring people. Uh, whereas workplaces that are divided, where the politics of division are, are at play, people are, are loath to actually mentor each other. And if we don't have mentorship between the higher-ups and uh, those entering the market, the, the workplace, those entering the workplace are not going to develop. So divisive politics is not good for the so-called populist agenda. Um, and uh, the, the age of it being good for the elitist is also over, and, and thank God for that. You know, the, the, there's a bit of a false binary going on, and we, we will come to this theme of false binary over and over and over again, but there's a false binary between populism and elitism. And that's, it's not true. You don't have to choose one or the other. There's a third way. It's called pluralism. It's when we can actually just respect each other and understand that we don't have the ultimate truth and we don't have a monopoly on the truth. And that we're still learning. We're still figuring this out together. But we were able to have an honest conversation of it with ourselves and actually take real action. Not just talk about it, but actually do it. So... That would be proper pluralism, where diversity is your strength. Um, whereas elitism saying, well, the CEO is evil. He doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand what life is about. Or, um, or, or I suppose the elitist agenda saying, well, you know, the uneducated people that work for me don't have a say in anything uh, and, and, aren't, and are incidental to my business and I can just exploit them. Um, you know, populism had a real reason for existing. It was responding to something, and it was re- it was responding to something real and relevant, and it had to. So dumb it down. So so for instance, like I Ian Fur found of Sorbet um, on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about this exact thing. I said, "What do you feel made Sorbet a success?" So mm-hmm. you know that that was a monster acquisition or exit from on his side. Um, and I said to him, what, what do you attribute your success to Sorbet on? And he said, well, there was two things. One was the fact that he, he adopted the franchise uh, approach to help scale Sorbet. Mm-hmm. But then he said, the other thing was what you're talking about, which is the culture of the business and, um, and breaking down race relations. Mm. Because he's got, how many staff did he have, guys? 3,000, something like that. Mm. You know, that's ridiculous. You've got mm. all sorts of colors of the rainbow in there. Mm. Um, and so, you know, for him to be able, and also to do this in a way that was replicable uh, was the key. 
you know. So mm. he personally, up until even like, I mean, this is a 14, 15 year old business. Mm. And up until the time that he sold it, he was still leading the onboarding. Yeah, of well, stuff. I mean, that's well, crazy. Well, what's amazing about Ian Fur is that he's a, an expert in neighbor relations. And before he actually started um, Sorbet, he was probably one of the most successful and most fascinating labor relations uh, uh, consultants in the country after his you know, experience with, uh, with you know, various other businesses. One of the things that I remember him saying in a talk when he, talk, when he was saying, how do you resolve the conflicts in the business? And he said, you know what? I just made one point of focus, the customer. Uh, Steve Jobs said the exact same thing when they asked him, how do you get people from different disciplines who are all A-types? Because, you know, Steve Jobs famously said, only want to play with uh, with A-types and, and people who bring the A-game. And I said, how do you get those guys to play together? He said, we made it about the product. So for Ian, for... Uh, wasn't so much it obviously is about the product but the, but his product is service uh, invariably and that was I suppose his kind of uh, way of dealing with the perception um, that hierarchy was somehow a bad thing well let's talk hierarchies because um, I've been following a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff I don't know whether mm. if you if you check out a lot of his stuff yeah so he talks um, a lot about hierarchies and how they are present in literally everything. Yes. Um, and he speaks a lot about like gender equality, for instance. Like here we, you know, there's BE, which is a obviously sensitive subject for for many entrepreneurs, um, but also a very necessary device. One would one could argue, mm -hmm. um, in order to um, you know empower the previously dispossessed sure and what what jordan peterson kind of said which i thought was really fascinating just as an example is when you when you take gender equality for instance and you know he's a social psychologist and a researcher and what have you and basically in in the nordics they uh, they enforced gender equality mm -hmm. throughout like her, it was literally equal mm. and so and he was and as he described he was saying that you know that when you do that, you reinforce the biological differences between men and women. And so what you do, because of the hierarchy, is you create uh, dispossessed uh, you know, aspects of that hierarchy as it relates to gender equality. Mm -hmm. And I found that like really, really, really interesting because of the, the motivations for feminism and, of course, Me Too and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's necessary, but it's interesting how much we don't know in terms of the consequences of adopting a particular approach. And, you know, going back to the business, if it's, if it's a cultural thing that one's trying to build, you, we, we still don't, at least in my experience, it's very hard to know unless you've been someone like Ian Fur who has a huge passion and a deep respect and appreciation and knowledge for something like race relations and how you break that whole thing down and ultimately scale it and get everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that... 40 year 50 year experience behind you there's a lot you don't know so as you start to execute and build a team like we're doing here at digital kung fu ultimately it's like there are two types of consequences one that's positive and one and that could be very negative but you don't know until it's almost too late sure i uh, you know where i think jordan peterson i i like a lot of his stuff but uh where i disagree with him is that he he kind of brushes off western society as he, he, he kind of says, you know, it had its problems uh, without really analyzing what the problems are and then says, but it was a relative, it's, it's a relatively stable, productive and prosperous um, society. And, uh, and certainly since the Industrial Revolution, I mean, just taking one number, the life, global life expectancy before the Industrial Revolution, before the advent of capitalism and uh, the evil hierarchies was 29 years old. In 2018, the global life expect expectancy is 74 years old. So clearly, the evil hierarchies are doing a, a relatively good job of keeping people alive and living longer and earning more money and having more economic freedom. But those same uh, industrialized nations, those same Western uh, hierarchies that Jordan Peterson brushes over, and I, I do like a lot of his stuff, but I have a problem with the fact that he brushes over it, 
they were guilty of the very things that he accuses identity politics of to some degree. So let's go back to gender equality in those Nordic societies. Yes, they said, we're all meritocratic. We are all, we're all about the equality of between men and women, except they didn't really practice that. What do you mean? Ultimately, they still promoted men over women. They st if, they, if, they, if women were not being, uh, I suppose, pushed on some level, kept uh, 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 below the, f the top of the food chain, which is where obviously everybody should rightfully go if your work is good and, uh, and, and, you're, a and you're efficient uh, and you get along with your customers and your coworkers, you should rise. There's no reason not to. Um, so if you're not rising, and the numbers, and the, the data shows it, right? So if there is only 2% of women in an, in an exco, and you claim to have a meritocracy, but you had an equal, uh, equal number of, in, uh, of inflow but from both genders, because supposedly you have gender equality and a meritoc meritocracy in this Nordic idea, um, then why only 2% in exco? That doesn't make any sense. There must be some something else at play. Now, I want to draw to just something else. We know from the corporate boardrooms, all of us, I mean, everybody watching this, you and me, that in every corporate, in every company, there are inner circles and outer circles, right? Even, even at exco level, even at middle management level, there are the people who are favored by the CEO and the, and the, and the power in the room. And then there are people that are kind of irrelevant, kind of blamed for things that maybe they didn't necessarily do, that right there is also a tyranny of either or. And that's the very thing that Jordan Peterson accuses the social justice warriors of, which they're no doubt guilty of. But he's, he, he should look at, at where they learn certain tricks from and where... Listen, and Western democracy and individualistic democracy, listen, Western democracy, as Jordan Peterson very correctly says, is founded on the basic principle that the individual is sovereign. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, <clears throat> but also that we relate one-to-one -to, -one to each other. That you and me can relate, can sort out our differences one-to-one. -one. I don't class you as people who wear camo tops and therefore behave in the way that people who wear camo tops behave. Can't believe you just brought my shirts into this conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know that that was superficial. <laughs> Damn it, I shouldn't have changed this shit. <laughs> All the topic to fashion, because I have no idea what we were talking about. Um, <laughs> but, no, seriously, where were we? <laughs> you were saying um, the individual. The individual. So it does start with the individual. And, and that, in a way, goes back to what Ian Fur did. He said, let's make this about service. Let's make it about the customer. It's not about who you are. It's not about who I am. It's not about me being the boss and you being the worker. It's about how you deal with that customer one-to-one -one as an individual. That was fundamentally an, a, 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 a... On one level, it began as a Western society idea. Uh, but it's fundamentally an individualistic soci social idea, mm. which Western society has relatively successfully spread to many other societies. We can no longer say that Western society is the only society in the world that champions the rights of the individual. That's no longer true. Thank God. Mm. Um, there's been a wonderful mix of the two. Um, but, the, but the problem, and this is where... Um, I suppose in and then any politics is where it gets dangerous is groupthink and collectivism, mm. and that is obviously where the individual's rights, the individual's uh, um, uh, expertise and opinions are no longer regarded as relevant, and instead they're replaced with what is your what what identity are you affiliated with. So if you are a certain race, a certain gender, a certain background, I would judge you on that. Now, obviously, we know what that leads to. Racism, sexism. Um, it could lead to, in, in terms of lifestyle affiliation, it could lead to homophobia. Um, and, you know, in, in, in that sense, Nazi Germany was collectivist. Uh, Mao Zedong's China was collectivist. Um, communist Russia is, is, is collectivist. Um, we also saw something positive, obviously, come out of communist Russia, which was... Although I don't agree with socialism, 
And if you're working in a corporate today and you're making money off corporate uh, or, 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 for, or for business enterprise and free market and you think that you're a socialist, I have news for you. That's not where your bread is buttered. Um, so, sorry, I know you're idealistic, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a good combination of, 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 of socialism and capitalism. Socialism ultimately is the only uh, ideological response to labor conditions. Capitalism did not address this, not for many, many, many years. It has addressed it now, in part thanks to socialism. Socialism, it, capitalism doesn't have to stop being capitalism. It had to become enlightened. It had to become self-informed. But um, it needed social to, socialism to get there. But so, fundamentally, socialist collectivist societies and, and, and countries, such as Russia, communist China, Cuba, uh, Nazi Germany, etc., apartheid South Africa, failed. Mm. They have not worked. If you look at the Middle East, most of it, is overrun by collectivist um, populist societies that claim to speak for the people but oppress the people. And it is the most destitute and most uh, economically challenged and war-torn region in the entire world. And that is a purely collectivist, highly influenced by socialism region. So, I mean, the interesting thing about this whole subject for me is how how little we talk about it. <clears throat> Do you know what I'm saying? Because it's it's like a, it's taboo. Mm -hmm. It's like we you know we don't like talking about um, racial prejudices or individual prejudices. You know, like if you take if you're going back to your point about the individual, mm -hmm. it's very easy to hold an individual accountable. If you say mm -hmm. if you said that, then mm -hmm. I can hold you accountable, right? Sure. But in going back to your point around um, the uh, like the group and the community, it's much harder to hold a community accountable. Do you know what I'm saying? Definitely. Where does the line stop? And also, at what mm. point do you, are you are your prejudices like we all have prejudices? Like I like mm. women, so I'm prejudiced towards women. Do you know what I mean? But at what point um, are you are your prejudices? Are no you prejudiced towards women, or are you biased towards being attracted and liking women? Both. Okay. <laughs> I have a prejudice. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, we have these, um, these kind of uh, organizing principles that motivate the decisions that we make when it comes to hiring, firing, the cultures that we build, and the way that we communicate vision, to your point around mm. Ian Fern, how mm. he's done that. Mm. Um, but it's just, it, I just find it interesting that when, like, where does the buck stop? Does it stop at the individual or does it stop at the collective? You're talking about socialism and capitalism. Right, and in both of those contexts, you have both instances of individualism and then collectives, right? But where does the buck stop when it comes to accountability? Does it come? Does it start with the or start with the individual entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. And where does it stop? At what point does culture be, grow beyond the entrepreneur? Does it make sense? Yeah, um, it's like culture trump, trumps strategy, for instance. Yeah, okay, so where where does culture end and the individual begin? Yes. So that is that is a, that is a million dollar question. That is what company cultures that are very successful, such as let's take Investex, got a wonderful company culture that champions the individual, but they have a very strong sense of what Investec culture is. And you might not fit into that culture, and if you don't fit into that culture, you probably won't last it for very long. But they really want you to succeed on your own steam. They don't expect you to be part of an affiliated group and, and for the group to succeed. They want you to succeed, which in a sense is very true um, to an anti-hierarchical idea, isn't it? Because the second the individual has power in order to, to shape their destiny in the organization, they the, the hierarchy isn't as powerful as it used to be. The individual can say, I succeeded. I did this, I brought this deal into the mix. Um, and the hierarchy has to play along with the individual's achievements. Um, but back to the, the balance of culture and thing. Listen, uh, great companies tend to build a bit of a tribal following internally, but what they do, I think quite successfully, is that they um, unite the people from different creeds and different uh, disciplines around that 
around their culture, which is also, I, I guess, you know, people argue against uh, patriotism. You know, like, why have patriotism? You know, we need to have a country that's united. We need, we need to have a country where people have a common sense of purpose and destiny. Mm. Otherwise, we will have constant division and nothing will work and the power stations uh, will do load shedding. Oops, I think, yeah, we're there. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we need to do these things, but we need to balance the rights of the individual and obviously the, the narrative of the culture. And some cultures' narratives are not good for individuals, such as extreme socialism and identity politics, where it doesn't matter what character you have as a person, it doesn't matter what your moral values are, you look a certain way, you act a certain way, and it affiliates with a bigger group, and therefore you are like them. But it's interesting, as, as leaders though, do you know what I mean? So I interviewed Jason <clears throat> Zanopoulos from Native, probably like two years ago, when I said to him, how have you built native VML to be such a <clears throat> very excess- successful agency. And he spoke to me at length about this concept of tribes. And it very much felt to me that it was a, it was a celebration of, uh, of groups rather than it was the celebration of the individual talent. And, and I'd like to get your view on, <clears throat> like, again, where does it start and where does it stop? Because, like, you have to, I have to grow Mav over there and I have to grow Sonal and I have to grow, like, my, a lot of my team individually, right? But collectively, the, it's a team effort to produce output that grows the business, right? So I know it's a balancing act, but, I mean, if, if, Nate, if um, Jason's whole approach is around this whole concept of tribes, um, where does the where do you draw the line between like celebrating individualism or celebrating groups? So, for instance, I've just before you answer that, like for instance, I've been thinking, well, what if I and I'm genuinely thinking about this is giving ten percent of the profits of the business to all permanent staff every year. So then I think, well, but then how does that work? Because Mav did you know ten x and then Sonal did seven x. So now am I disadvantaging? Mav, because he feels he did 10 and Sonal only did 7. But do you see what I mean? It's like as you, it's almost like communism where everybody shares in the equal benefits and opportunities of that system. And when you try and apply that, again, it's like bonuses. So do I give Mav a bonus and then prorate that against the performance rate card? That's one way to do it. Or do I just say, hey, guys, collectively, um, you know, you're going to get 10% of the business provided we kick ass and take names every year. Do you know what I'm saying? So what, which is the best approach? Well, in the case of bonuses, uh, what you tend to find a lot of companies do is combine the two, don't they? They say, well, the, the bonus level will be X because we did really well this year, or the bonus level will be Y because we had a, a shitty year. And then within that, there's also an individual achievement score, and it's combined together. So there's a combination. I just want to take a, just a quick step back in terms of tribes versus individuals. Um, at the most basic level, and not an extreme level, at a very basic level, the, the, the need to collect into groups is incredibly natural. We network together, we specialize together, we uh, collaborate together, we form departments, we form teams and uh, some shows that J- Jason Zanopoulos was talking about specific teams in the business that were doing really well and had a wonderful sense of culture amongst them that maybe was a little bit different to another team. That's all very natural. It becomes dangerous when team A has a, a, a identifies in a certain way, and then whenever anybody joins team B from the outside, like a new employee – And they've never done a day of work with Team B, but they just join and they introduce themselves to Team A and they go, oh, hi, I'm new here. I just joined Team B, actually. And Team A goes, oh, you're like that. And That happened to you yesterday. (laughs) So they're in in the issue. Um, But at a very basic level, at a non-extremist level, we do, we group together. We form tribes. Mm. The question is, do we, let, do we let it turn into extremes like collectivism or egoism um, or not? Now, I have to sound a little bit academic for a second, but um, in the 16th century, there was a philosopher named uh, Michel de Montaigne, and Michel de Montaigne had a lot to talk about liberal, liberal humanism. 
which essentially was also a, to some degree, anti-hierarchical philosophy, right? Because humanism basically said the hierarchy in which I am subject to the will of the gods is no longer 100% true. I actually think that I have individual will and that I need to improve myself as a, as a person. And it's not just all about um, if something bad happens, God did it. And if something uh, good happens, God also did that as well. I have, to, I have to take responsibility and credit myself. That was the foundation of humanism. Now, in a healthy form, there's a healthy humanism and there's a, there's a toxic humanism. Like a, there's a healthy masculinity, there's a toxic masculinity. We have to accept that both exist. Um, and we can't ignore that toxic masculinity exists. It does exist. We've seen the impact of it. And we also can't ignore that healthy masculinity also exists and we should try and promote it as much as we can without being uh, ignorant of the evils of the, of the former. Um, so Michel de Montaigne's warning to us was, listen, guys, it's all good and well that you believe in yourself. You take credit for your own achievements. Uh, but if you don't have an overriding empathy for yourself and for others, if you don't have the ability to listen and be honest with yourself and others, this wonderful notion of humanism will turn into collectivism in no time. Okay. And now, so what you do find with a lot of the, um, the groups that self-identify within identity politics, which then decide that other groups are evil and, and illegitimate, and they are, and only they are legitimate, a lot of it stems from the age-old problem. They're actually really insecure. They feel in disenfranchised. They feel disempowered. They are not coping or dealing with being at the bottom of the food chain or the middle of the food chain uh, in a very confident way. And they're using whatever they can at their disposal in order to attack back. And if you're the disenfranchised in the internet era, the number one weapon at your disposal is social media. And social media essentially gave the masses a, um, a microphone um, in which they could shout and they could make claims. Some of those claims, obviously, are entirely false. And some of those claims actually needed to come out. So, obviously, there are a huge amount of aspects. In fact, I would say most of the aspects of, say, the hashtag MeToo movement that were absolutely necessary. And we needed to have that conversation. Um, and, you know, obviously, there are extremes within there, which, you know, where I think men pushed back, etc. But... Those, those conversations needed to happen. When you see the abuse of power, and again, I have to, I have to I'm, not, I'm not a social justice warrior, but yes, toxic masculinity does exist. It does exert an incredibly negative and uh, an abusive relationship um, on women in so-called individualistic societies. Like we were saying before, they say they're individualistic, but actually they're grouping men and they're grouping women. But that's also disenfranchised men in many respects. So because men, <clears throat> in other words, what's happened is in, as a result of Me Too and so forth, it's put the conversation front and center for, for as, you, as you say and correctly say, for the right reasons. But now equally, it's made men fearful of how to act, how to speak, how to engage, because now they feel threatened, you see. So you've almost got this situation where you've got individual rights yeah. and the pursuit for equality but sure. that manifests either way you push it something like if men push it from into in, like you say like your your negative masculinity mm -hmm. or whatever whatever word you use there but if they push it it's bad for women but if women push it push back suddenly men do you know what i mean feel frightened and fearful about how what they can and can't do and behave in the workplace so mm -hmm. so do you see mm -hmm. so it's it's this thing where it's this hierarchical system based on individual like individual um, prejudices mm -hmm. in the pursuit of rights um, and you know there's almost it seems to me like e any way you go going back to my original point around the entrepreneur like there's consequences for every move sure you know it this this comes back to the need to be able to have an honest conversation with yourself and develop what Michel de Montaigne talked about the friendship with self and with others and to have that true empathy now Obviously, when um, 
self-identifying as a group or identity politics becomes bullying to somebody else, that's an extreme. Um, I would say that many revolutions don't begin, uh, some begin peacefully, some begin violently. There was a certain maybe uh, maybe violent and intense uh, aspect to me too, but it had to be. There had to be a lightning bolt um, that goes through society. It absolutely just needed to happen. When we uncovered the crimes of guys like Harvey Weinstein, etc., it became very apparent how prevalent it was in the so-called liberal societies that were saying one thing but doing another. Um, but now, after that lightning bolt, the real question is, what's the next step? And, you know, like we would talk in, in, a, in a business plan, you have phases, don't you? You begin doing phase one is one, and then phase two has different objectives. Phase one, we had to wake the world up 100%, and people had to listen to what women were saying. They, they, simply, they simply do, and they, and they, they did, and they still do. Um, but, this, but the next step becomes, okay, fine. You've defined what toxic masculinity is, What's healthy masculinity? And that is a question that men need to answer. Yep. So what's interesting, uh, Jordan Peterson has a view on that. It's kind of like we, it's like, I know it's, this is pretty ethereal and academic now, but it's kind of like, you know, um, we kind of grew out of Neanderthal, <laughs> out of the Neanderthalism or whatever, um, and became conscious beings. Mm. And then we, we, you know, we created these rights based on the individual. Mm. And now these rights um, have uh, been expressed and evolved in places and in ways that shine a light on prejudices that aren't fair. Um, and so as a result of, of like the, just the fundamental evolution of humanity, we have to work this out because, you know, everywhere you look, it's like the Kevin Hart and the Oscars debacle. Did you see that? Mm, that was, that was interesting actually. And the way he dealt with it was quite interesting too. Yeah. Because I mean, he basically turned around and said, listen, I'm not the guy I was. Yeah, you said I've changed, dude. I, 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 you, I evolved. You I can't made, crucify me for eight years ago. I made, I made mistakes. I've been public about my transformation. I don't know why I should be dragged over the coals yet again for it. Um, you know, American media is hypersensitive, and they're so scared of the um, of the media crisis and being crucified and tarred and feathered in public that they they rather just avoid the risk on that kind of sense. Yeah, like the great philosopher Beyonce said, you know, if you challenge racism, you challenge the fabric of America or you challenge America. It's like basically you're saying, you know, racism is so deeply ingrained in the, you know, the societal condition of ordinary Americans that that is the reality. And so <clears throat> that's why, you know, these instances like with Kevin Hart, mm. Um, you know, I mean, f to be fair, like it is eight years ago, do you know what I mean? But again, it's like he's being held accountable at an individual level when actually homophobia um, w is is a group thing, which is still very prevalent. But how do you hold, do you see, it's like it's very hard to hold a group accountable. So it's actually, it's like, how do you change the perspective and the perception and the, and the actions and behaviors of an entire group of men, for instance? So like all these men here, like Mav and, and uh, Chris and some, and you and me, we now need to decide as a group what is the right uh, approach to, to equality. Do you know what I mean? Well, from, a, from a man's perspective or whatever that might be. Listen, we're going to meet together in groups and groups are already happening. I mean, for many years, there's been, a, there's been an organization called the Mankind Project. Um, and they've been trying to answer those questions of what is a healthier form of masculinity, for example. And listen, men were not uh, raised with great emotional technology, shall we, shall we put it. You know, they were told, cowboys don't cry, don't express your feelings, don't deal with your feelings. Um, any kind of vulnerability is a, is a form of weakness. And none of this is, I mean, like it served us in war. It served us in... I suppose a, a very sort of um, combative form of uh, of business, which we're moving out of. I mean, thankfully to the age of collaboration and the trust economy, all those things really point to collaboration, which are which don't point to the old male values of don't listen to people, don't work with people. Everybody is your competitor, 
You know, suddenly everybody's my collab- my collaboration partner potentially. Um, I can network with people. This is a, a different value to what um, the old order um, of hierarchy was doing. Um, so I think it's just about finding. I, I, I suppose just about finding that finding that balance. And listen, men will have to meet, and also then form individual approaches. And then when a man does something or a woman does something, they should be judged on that on their individual action and not ascribed to their gender and not ascribed to the, the, the color of their skin. And we, we saw what happens when you ascribe traits to the color of a skin across a, a group of people. You, we, 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 I mean, we live, in, we live in South Africa. We know what that means. Um, so we, we have to be really, really careful. So again, it's, it's that balance between um, learning together as a tribe, achieving together as a team, um, but at the same time, individual merit, in individual uh, innovation. And listen, if we were to stifle um, the tribe, we won't get as much done because tribes are also based on collaboration. Mm. That's what that's what teams exist. Uh, but if we stifle the individual, we won't have innovation. We won't have new ideas, and we won't have people challenging a norm that might be very problematic, such as systemic racism. So Mike Stopworth put this thing out on LinkedIn the other day as post. He said, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, what is the principal cause, in your view, of the, or, uh, the principal cause for all the problems that South Africa has economically and also at a societal level? <clears throat> so he's doing this um, sustainability course at the London School of Economics, I believe. Mm. So I just said indifference. Remember that, I think you even commented on mm. that. That's for me. That's what it actually comes mm. down to. It's the sense that you are different to everybody else. You know what I mean. And whether one, I'm in, I'm different to you, right? So I'm indifferent to you. Yeah. There's a difference. <laughs> but when I'm in, when I feel like I'm indifferent to you or a culture of a business or to the vision of the business or just to, to the people that I work with, inevitably that comes with problems. Mm. You know, it's like I think you were talking about uh, lung arm. <laughs> I always talk about lung arm. It's the most fascinating dance. No one ever bumps into each other. It's incredible. How is that possible? I don't know. It's like it's like random chaos See, maths. I know. On the dance There's floor. no indifference whatsoever there. Yeah, they're all the same, and they all look like strange. It's a harmony. It's Sorry beautiful. Those people. Um, <laughs> yeah. You, l- l- listen. Back to the point, though. Um, it's it's realizing that again the false binary of elitism versus populism is rubbish. But we need to embrace pluralism where we actually respect each other's differences. We don't judge each other based on group affiliation, but rather as individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the case of South Africa, we, we've, we have a society that's been relatively good at championing the individual to a degree and very bad at championing tribal identity as a country to a degree um so we've kind of failed on both on both sides to be honest with you the 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 sad truth about south africa and i I mentioned on that thread was for me the indifference flowed from from a, a from a lack of common identity and purpose i don't know what the south african narrative is and i don't know many south africans who do um and that, to me, is a fundamental problem. What is our story? What's our narrative? Is our story only that we overcame um, a colonial tyranny? Uh, I think that's only part of our story. That's a that's a previous battle. That's that's a war. That war was won, excellent, and it must become part of the story. What else defines our story? We can never forget that war. That war was definitive for us, without question. But what else is part of our story? Like. What what it, like when we talk about America, for example, it's a country that's been very good at, at constructing its own narrative, um, and it's done so fairly successfully because people from different cultures and different and diverse backgrounds go to America, and they become uh, African American, Portuguese American, Irish American, um, uh, German American. Do you see what's happening here? Yeah, it's, it's always combined. They're very they're very good at at, at the Amer- at the American story and the American story is um, land of the free, home of the brave. It champions pioneership, hard hard work, nice Protestant ethic, um, 
and it's an a, equal opportunity an equal opportunity and that that really is the american story we didn't have to struggle we don't, I didn't have to google that i wouldn't have to have a whole long conversation about what do you think it might be we know where it is we're not even american but we don't know as south africans what the south african story is the chinese have a story and they know exactly what it is brazilians too russians too uh, israelis too etc south africans not so clear on that so i think that needs to happen and um i mean while i have a microphone and i get to say something i'm just going to say it i think that we we instead of ignoring the past i mean i don't think we do ignore the past but i feel that there's there's some fundamental issues in south africa in terms of cultural heritage being transmitted through society and when i when i look you know people land in south africa they may mistake in they may they might mistake to be landing in europe this country looks like europe really <laughs> yeah not all of it does it really <laughs> not all of it but if you land in cape town <clears throat> if you land in cape town i don't think you yeah. do <laughs> it's like what the fuck yeah, it looks better than europe <laughs> i don't know but no no you land in cape town that airport you drive into cape town it's like parts of croatia i know because people of croatian have uh, croatians have gone this is like home um so Joburg the same a lot of the infrastructure does not reflect the cultural heritage of the people and that fundamentally needs to change where is the cultural heritage story of dominant tribes in this country such as Zulu and Xhosa i don't see that and i think that that's a big issue then the second question becomes what is the di- what is the what is the narrative for the diversity but I think it's difficult to have that that second conversation about diversity and pluralism in the country until we have actually strengthened the heritage and uh, and history and envi- and, and, and the envi- and, a, and a relationship with the environment with the majority of the country because they don't feel that when you talk to a lot of black south africans they say I feel dislocated from the society I feel economically pushed out um and it's not just economically it's also culturally um so i think those things need to be addressed i don't have the answers i'm identifying some of the problems i've got more uh, strong opinions i'm not an economist and i'm not a politician i've got stronger opinions about organizations and about um brands and media and marketing and uh, and 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 social narratives um but that's just my non-expert opinion on on what ails South Africa. So let's let's wrap up and dumb this down for for entrepreneurs, right? So if you're trying to build a culture and you're trying to break down race relations and build a team that's focused on a single outcome, what's like let's just together define three principles. I think the first one is let's borrow from Ian and make it not about the team, make it about something uh you know, unif- that unifies yeah. your team. But that doesn't involve anything to do with individualism and who you are. And who you are. No, it doesn't have to do with identity. Identity, sorry, yeah. It can it can have everything to do with individualism. It shouldn't have to do anything with your identity as a person. If you're black, white, woman, uh, man, uh, gay, or transgender, you sh- you you're, you're judged by your own abilities and your abil- and your and your achievement with that that point of focus. Whether it's Steve Jobs' focus as a product or Ian's. uh being the customer service the second one i think where the hi- where hierarchies obviously failed in both individualistic society and collective society was the failure to listen and really acknowledge what was going on with people that were not top of the food chain and obviously this is it's and and the, what's what's the nature of hierarchy is that there's a scrounge for resources you were talking about uh, 10% equity and and what would that mean so distributing more resource in a fair and equitable manner there are many theories about this we don't have time to go into them um but how do we at least listen to people and have an honest conversation with ourselves if somebody even at a at top level management feels that they're being edged out of the inner circle and it's now the either or scenario again i'm not i'm no longer in the favorites camp anymore they need there needs to be a a way for them to communicate what's going on and for there to be a, a very sober way to say listen at a meritocratic level you've either achieved very well and we should have recognized it or you have not achieved very well and you have not met um your own goals that you set for yourself you have not met them 
um, there's a line that we have to draw there. We can't uh, simply be empathetic and just and just listen all the time. We have to draw a line. What about a compelling vision is the third <clears throat> principle? Absolutely. Because, I mean, um, I got asked that the other day. I was, um, I'm interviewing, I'm basically building a management team, and one, and one of the candidates said to me, well, what's your vision? <laughs> I was like, hmm. And I didn't have a clear answer for her. You had like a million notes on your on your on your on your phone that you had written it down and yeah. reversion and reversion and reversion and reversion. And then when they said, "So what's your vision?" you were like, "Which note was the one?" But it's true. Most, I mean, you find. I mean, you and I know this just from building big brands um, in South Africa. Um, is that you know F and B has a clearly articulated vision? Do you know what I mean? As does Microsoft. As does many of these other um, big brands. And yet, for startups, which is what we are, what's that? Like I know certainly Ford Lane doesn't have one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, uh, I mean even big guys. I mean I don't know. I, I mean I don't know if MTN feels that they have a clearly articulated vision on the inside. But I don't think anybody, any one of their customers or anyone in the country has any idea what that might be. But do the customers care? Yeah, they do. Do they? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you know, you know what, like, I, I think, listen, telcos are... What's Apple's vision? Think different. Is that their vision or their, their positioning line? No, no, their vision is for, is, you know, we're the, the country for... You know, we're the, we're the company for people who think different. We're the people who want to create things. We're people who want to who break the rules, etc. That's mm. very much Apple's vision. Mm. They, do they have a product product vision that matches that? Yep. Absolutely. They're one of the most idealistic companies ever. They literally just delete ports off their new models because they decide no longer relevant. We need to do something else now. And the whole and the and, and the entire industry goes. But we need a headphone jack. <laughs> A lot. We really need one. Apple's like, no, you don't. You just need Bluetooth AirPods or whatever Bluetooth AirPods you can get. Um, and that's, that's, that, that's how singular they are. Mm. The danger of populism at a leadership level, at a, at a vision setting level, is that you don't actually take leadership. You simply listen to what everybody says and you try to make everybody happy at different times. Eventually, you're screwing somebody yeah. over and eventually somebody gets upset, and if that somebody is loud enough, then it's a problem. That's not how you build a tribe. Um, you really need to take leadership. Leadership is about drawing the line. It is about making logical decisions that are not based on uh, your group of favorites uh, or, pe or people who look like you, but rather are what does your company actually stand for? And again, articulating that vision, I think it's obviously difficult and getting it right is difficult. Keeping it simple is difficult. Um, but then you see companies that have done it really successfully, such as, as you mentioned, Apple, et cetera, and it would be. Cool, dude. So uh, interesting, interesting chat. Um, mm. Pretty different to my usual shows. Um, but uh, any final comments, remarks? I think we've said all there is to say. <laughs> About identity <laughs> politics forever. <laughs> there's, pro there's, there's probably more, but there's just no time. Cool, guys. Thanks for sticking around. I'll catch you in another show. Oh, Ciao. I didn't show my inspirational no. quote. Do you want to do that? Fuck it. Let's do it. Inspirational quote coming up. Where's the sec? Take us through this one. Let me fall if I must. The one I will become will catch me. It's by the Baal Shem Tov. And he was a, um, he was a, a rabbi, a uh, rabbi you know, quite a long time ago. And the essentially idea is that you should be brave enough to fail uh, and realize that if you're able to learn from your failure, um, you'll become the person who transcended it, I suppose. I love that. Thanks, Brains. Awesome having you on the show. Thank Ciao. You. Thank you, Amy.